So we invite Charles Ledard. Uh, he's a um, landscape architect and uh, he's professor in the Université Nationale de Bretagne. And he's done some projects all over France and he's at the moment formal advisor for some mayors of different cities. Ren, beside them. Thank you very much. Can I, can I speak from here? Okay. So first I would like to thank very much APA and the Deputation of Barcelona to invite, for inviting me because yesterday I felt a little bit lonely as being the only Frenchman and, and even a bit shame. But then today I feel mainly proud to be European because I think the cross uh, section between all solutions are uh, really uh, joyful, I mean, makes me happy. I, I used to think that problems of Greek people were my problems, but now I think that they may invent solutions that will be my solutions. And so I'm very proud to be European. And, um, well, I am going, I love trees. It may not be a surprise to you because I am a landscape architect, so it, it's not a surprise. But then, for, since I, I started about 30 years ago, I think now that it may very well be the best thing I ha I've ever had the chance to, to do is to plant trees. So first, I would like to enlight uh, several reasons um, for um, to plant trees, and then I will try and tempt you to come to Rennes, where I work, to see a particular place called La Courouse, where we have, uh, with Bernardo Secchi and Paola Vigano, worked on a new neighborhood out of a formal um, uh, wasteland of a military uh, industrial area. So first, I would like to tell you about, to take you to, uh, about a recent visit I, I did to Nantes, Cité des Congrès. It made me realize how much trees do grow. That's the first point I would like to state. While working for Alexandre Shemetov, I had the opportunity to plant plain trees in the garden of the new Opera House. It's a, a project by Yves Lyon that stands in front of the harbor's dock. We, were, um, wa we wanted to plant some plain trees that were uh, supposed to be lined up with older trees. One of them grew fairly well. I planted this tree. Well, when I came out with my usual tape, it was too short. It's one meter 50, but the, the, the tree happens to measure 220. I, I mean, if somebody had told me that when I planted the tree, it, when I planted it, it must have been 35, 40. It was already big, but you know, 220, I was amazed. So my first point is, you should know, I know because I'm a little bit aged, you should know that the tree shows its time. And when, you know, times go so fast, it's very useful to have such things. Near the plane trees, we planted lines, rows of magnolias on a forecourt leading down to the entrance of the opera hall, built under the water level, so that the trees are planted actually on a slab cased to prevent the water to flood the hall, of course. So these trees have also grown, you see. Almost all went okay. But backwards, one discovers one magnolia planted higher before the court in true ground. This one is 120, while the other one on the slab case is only 55 or so. So that's my second point, second major discovery. The tree shows what is hidden. 
it shows underground. Now, I am going to show you some works of art, not many, three or four. I want you to consider them as indicators for the use of, of trees. This first picture I took in the Prado Museum. It's, you may know it, it's a, a painting from Correggio called Noli me tangere, which means do not touch me. It's what the Christ says to Mary Magdalena as she just discovered his empty tomb two days after the Passover. If we translate Noli me tangere by do not hold me, it means that um, you must accept separation. Actually, we see in Christ a shade of tenderness and understanding, reinforced by the twist of his body. But his refusal is final, as you know. When I took this picture in the Prado, I was struck by the important role played by the tree behind. If you look at it carefully, you think that it shares, by a similar movement, the tearing and compassion of Christ. Obviously, the tree shows the way from the ground where the dead bodies go to the sky, from the material world to celestial spheres, and to everyone, the tree shows its time, but it also shows a way, a vital impulse that help us uh, towards the anguish of future. You know, this is why people grow things, actually. And eventually, it's, it's also a symbol of rebirth. Also in the Prado, one can see one of my favorite paintings from Nicolas Poussin. It's an ideal landscape from 1651, uh, so it's about uh, uh, 130 years later. It's also called Paysage aux Trois Hommes. You see, there are three men. One of them could be Diogenes, you know, the, the, the Greek philosopher, and it's not quite sure, but he might be saying, he's asking his way to another one in, in, in front who is in the light, and he might be saying that he prefers to go to effeminate Athens than to virile and possibly winning Sparta. But it also could be called the landscape with, with three trees, because as you see, there is one dead tree in front, one young tree behind, which tells us about time, but there is a resilient tree on the left side. This means it's not easy to cut a tree, to get rid of a tree, and it seems that on the philosophical basis, it means that things may be more complex than they seem, and that you know the choice is always ours. So I see this as the tree as a model, in resilience, I mean. Now, Apart from Nicolas Poussin, another great landscape artist to me is John Ford, the American director. In this um, 1941 movie called How Green Was My Valley, he is actually, uh, it is a chronicle um, of life in the 19th century in the South Wales coal fields, just like in the Rue uh, yesterday. But mainly, the loss of that way of life and its effects on a hard-working Welsh mining family uh, living in this landscape blackened by the cold ma coal mines. Trouble comes when the mine owner lowers the wages and the workers strike in protest. On this shot, in the beginning of the movie, we see a beautiful tree on the left, you noticed it, of course, and it seems to be witnessing the relentless uh, story. Much later, the narrate, narrator of the film will say, um, men like my father cannot die, they are still with me, real in memory as they were in flesh, ever loving and ever beloved. How green was my valley then? You can, you can see that it's not so green, you know? <laughs> Here we, we see the tree as much as a resistant as a witness, in a violent contrast with the machine and the artificial landscape, it is silent, it is motionless, but it is extremely present, facing smoking homes, waiting wives on the, on the right, 
and these marching returning workers, uh, miners, who are on strike uh, from now on. And on this black and white picture, nothing could be greener and conceal more hope and life than, than the tree. Now, last one. From the Prado, I came to Reina Sofia from my last visit in, in, in Madrid, and I discovered a very in interesting piece from 61 from an American poet and performer called Jackson McLaw. He, it is called Tree Movie, and it's a simple shot of a living tree, and as the movie, uh, as a silhouette upon the sky. The camera does not move, only the tree does. Having spent some time watching, one experiments a subtle and amazing real effect. It is said that in this pre-Warhol static film, the intention was to implement the de-skilling of artistic practice, thereby destroying any distinction between specialist and amateur, between the artist and the viewer. The principle is the open score, uh, consisting of instructions that anyone can follow without having to know any specific language, whether musical or film. The score's footnote turns it into a general plan, like any object could be the subject of a film, the essential element being the static position of the camera. Nevertheless, I don't buy that last line. Personally, I believe that it is not, not by chance that this is a tree as the focus of this tree movie. It is known that in the wind, the, the, leaves, um, the leaves trembling you know, in the wind did strike the most, the first viewers of a movie ever. It happened on a Saturday, December 28th, 1895, in the basement of the Grand Café, Boulevard des Capucines in Paris, as the first film was shown to the general public. The, you know, the, the film recording powers make an important place to what happen, happens in addition. Since the movement of the leaves in a tree to a real accident, impossible to predict. So the growth of the tree suggests that life lives there on the long term. But on the other hand, when you watch a tree, the trembling of the leaves reminds us of the fleeting moment we also experiment. The coincidence of both is what moves us so much in trees. I mean, you, you experimented this, of course, like me. But I believe it's good for health. I truly believe that. It is also what relates the tree to the landscape. Everything changes, you know? But one thing, the, the oak cannot become a willow or a poplar. It's just like Barcelona. I, I came here in the 90s. Everything has changed, except it's still Barcelona, <laughs> you know? So, this, the, there is something in this that is very precious in trees. You cannot say this about something else. For instance, if you think about it, to, to represent a tree, it's much more easy to do a drawing. If you, if you do the picture with a photograph, it's difficult in the forest and it's difficult to recognize. But a good designer can draw it just like drawing somebody's face, you know? And, and then you can recognize what is a poplar, what is an oak, and so on. So, now I want to show you, uh, when I started working with Shemetov in, in the late 80s, long before Google Earth and Street View, we were asked to work on the devastated landscape of the Moselle Valley between Metz and Thionville since the steel industry was shutting down. We were expected to draw the curtain on this terrible uh, show, like lines of Italian poplars, uh, to hide the dramatic scenes from the eyes of possible new investors, like German, probably, <laughs> Insta <laughs> coming from the rural. <laughs> Instead of hiding this terrible reality, we thought it would be more wise to draw it like we can draw 
trees to draw it very with an accurate image. I, I actually spent several months drawing this uh, design, which is 4 meters 60 long, out of the aerial photography to show all the components of this landscape, apart from the waste and industrial land in the middle. So just like in Essen, there lied still very beautiful pieces, like the river Moselle on the right, the canal in, of the steel mines, the career for the gravels, another highway, the train line, the ancient Roman road, the orchard roads, and the woody hills on the left side. Paying a special attention to this wounded landscape, to what the industrial withdrawal left seemed a better answer. For instance, in the, in the uh, confluence of the two rivers and the canal, the maximum chaos was, came from the addition of all different hubs, you know, highway, networks, power networks, train, train lines, and so on. At a certain point, we came to think that planting trees may very well be the answer, not at all to hide anything, but as on the opposite, to make the real landscape more visible and coherent and help the viewer to understand the reason for this multiple layers landscape at this special place of the confluence. At that time, I must have I, I, I must be uh, 24, and I have to confess, I thought it was a very thin argument, and, and um, I'm, I was not that sure that this would be the solution. Today, I really regret, I do regret, that we were not given the possibility to do that, because 25 years later, probably these trees would bring tourists to that place, you know? It, it's a real, uh, this I'm sure now about. Now, the Kourouz. Kourouz is a big uh, 140 hectares place uh, southeast of Rennes, uh, the city of Rennes in Brittany. Uh, it's about 200,000 uh, 200, um, uh, people over there, but the metropolis is about four, four times that number, that figure. And there are, uh, this is the master plan uh, from uh, 2004, and it shows that there are several types of urbanized uh, neighborhood planned there inside a green sponge. We were asked to do a green avenue from the inside of the, of the, from the central town to the outskirts of the town. You can see that there is the highway belt on the left, and there are two uh, uh, railway lines, one leading to south and one leading to west. And all these were industrial area, partly reclaimed with, um, by vegetation. Now, the, the central of the place is still the mil military campus. There are some militaries left. Um, I am going to show you three, um, th three um, um, special uh, case studies. I, I cannot tell you everything about this. It's, it's a 10 years uh, effort with Bernardo Secchi and Paola Vigano, but I want to enlighten three situation where we managed with trees, and you can think about what I just said before. First, we applied the um, uh, Slovenian recipe, you know, uh, reuse, recycle, and reduce. The first thing was reuse the actual existing vegetation. To do, to do that, we first had to make a general inquiry about what vegetation was there and which could be really um, uh, conserved. We probably underestimated the money needed to take care of these trees during 10 years, because in 10 years, everything changes especially with cranes and things like that. This is um, also to recycle. You have to know what was there. So this is a 19, uh, I think it's 1924 uh, picture, where you can see almost everything is covered with factories making bombs, you know. We 
um, when I say um, reuse is reuse of vegetation, but it's also recycle of grounds. So you have the issue of pollution, of course, but not only. Um, you have, for instance, we decided to keep rainwater on the surface, and for that we required the, the design of the railway, of the exploiting, uh, of the industrial railway uh, lines, which you can see are over everywhere. Now, now we have shifted our point of view. We are on top of the central town, and facing the outside. The, over there will be the highway. And this must be um, the maybe 1955 or so. So the first thing, thing I'm going to tell you about is the, the, we have tried to keep these trees here inside a building that was built by Felipe. So I'm going to show you how the fact that the tree shows his time is so precious when you have bright architects like him not afraid to do the lodging for tomorrow. If, if you have a tree that says, tells people it's possible to live there, even if uh, in, a, in a building that you've never seen in Brittany, <laughs> um, it helps enormously. You see, the, the house is on the right. This is the same same place nowadays from Google Earth. The second will be um, uh, the case, this, I show it to you now, because um, then you can know where it is. The second will be, you, you see the, there is this big uh, avenue there, and then you catch up with a, um, a busway crossing the, the wood there. So this busway was made as a path, um, um, a pedestrian path also, and we kept another big tree, and also um, we combined um, bus and pedestrian and cycling. And in the end, I will tell you about the avenue uh, on, the other, on, on, on the end. So first, these trees. This is just when the, the, the big factories were uh, demolished, and you can see the, the concrete is gently uh, over everywhere, which is not so good for next trees. <laughs> but these are the oaks we wanted to keep. So the first thing is to get rid of the, of the concrete and design on the surface the 14 by 14 a square that would be kept intact inside the underground um, uh, parking lot. Then we managed to, to put some pillars, uh, concrete pillars, to prevent the ground from uh, you know, uh, cracking down. Now you have the trees protected, the three trees protected on top, and during the, the uh, the work in progress, I, I must say that we told the contractor that we would like him to keep the trees. We, we knew it was uh, more expensive, and so we did not want to force him. But once he said, he was said, um, you can show us how skillful you are, <laughs> you know, as a challenge, they really uh, put up with the challenge, and they were very, very happy. In the end, you see, the, the trees have never grown uh, so well because all the rainwater of the building is drawn to the, the foot of the, of, the, of the trees, and actually the light uh, comes like never, and they are prevented from wind. So now it's like salad. It's, uh, <laughs> it's incredible. Now there are only two trees, but the third uh, was attacked by insects, so we, we had to get rid of them, in spite of the, of the people who, uh, from, the, uh, from the, the, the housing. Now, the, the, the busway now. This busway has a special um, uh, history. 
when we were asked to do the, this uh, linkage for bus, the, the munis municipality insisted that it would be placed there, and Bernardo Secchi was very much afraid that once it's built, uh, uh, houses would come, uh, you know, and first, any cars would take this way. <laughs> he even said, uh, we know how it works. First you have the deputy car, and then you have taxis and ambulances, and then everybody's car, and so on. And there was a clash of culture because the, Brit the people from Brittany told this Italian uh, professor that it would not happen like that because in Brittany law is law, <laughs> and, and that they would stand in front. And so uh, Bernardo Secchi said to the Lord Mayor, uh, if you do this, uh, Charles Dowd will enchain himself to the, to the trees and you'll have to saw him with the tree. I was very much afraid of that and, I, <laughs> and the mayor told me, uh, Mr. Dowd, people are more important than trees. And I swear to myself, I will not be told this twice. <laughs> because of course, I think people are more, you know, of course, important than trees. And, and now when I, I teach about trees to, to students, I say um, you, the use is more important than what you do with uh, than the trees, of course. So you have to think about usage, of course, before any project. So we, we had to have a, a bus uh, coming and the bus cannot go down and up and, up and down, you know, it's like a highway, it's something very hard. So we had to get rid of the wall and we knew that this busway would be something very hard on the nature there. This is why we first designed it making a sort of S uh, so that the length would be long enough for the, for the slope to be slow. And then we had to deal with the water and to, you see, it, when the snow comes, it looks really terrible. So to prevent the water to go, to flow at once to the sewer, you know, we, we had to store it. And in the same time, this dike that stores water, you see, the busway is on the left, where the car is, just like Bernardo Secchi said. And, <laughs> And then, and then you, you, you have this dike to prevent the water to go out, and you have this um, machine to, to contain, you know, to limit the flow. So all this is very difficult in such a place, but we had also several oaks that were embedded in the ground, and we could liberate them. And we did this, and you see the, the tilia, exceptional tilia we saw before. He is behind there, behind the guy, and he will be protected by the fact that he's now shown to the people and that nobody will, will actually stroll at his foot because the, the, um, the ramp is behind, is in front, you see? So the funny thing is that in that very small path, if you have the original... Um, uh, the original path with stairs, the new big busway, and an intermediate path, so three paths, it, everything looks more thick, and actually it's more solid. It's like a park. But this is genuine landscape artistry, <laughs> if I may say. It's like, uh, you know, in Chinese garden, they do three, uh, if, uh, as, as small as the garden may be, you can pour it things. You know, if, if it's too big, you should be retain yourself <laughs> and keep it vast. So this is the place now. You, you hardly see the, the path, but what you can be sure of is that when you stroll there, you cannot miss the tree. And before, well, we, we could see it, but not always. You know, it depends on the light and so on. Now it's really put up, and we know that it will be kept because it's genuinely exceptional tree. Here you see it's a tilia, it's a sepe, I don't know how you say that in, in but it's 35 uh, trunks in the same place, you know, it's something uh, you, couldn't ob you couldn't, could no, not even obtain. Now the last uh, case study is this uh, recycling thing, 
from um, uh, formal military uh, railway. This railway was used to support trains with tanks, you know, char uh, d'assaut. Um, of course, it is a very hard, and we had to put on uh, an avenue, to construct an avenue, and we thought it would be wise to use this. But the military said, oh no, it is strategic, you cannot touch it. So we had to do the, the avenue, to make the avenue on the side. And that costed about six or eight beautiful oaks. And once we had chopped them off and made the avenue, the military says, oh, after all, you can do what you want with the, with the train, you know? So I, I went mad. I said, of course we're not going to get rid of that railway that costed us so much. So we thought about what can we do with it, and we thought it, we, we can make it uh, the cycling path, because, uh, you know, if you cycle on... If you imagine you are the locomotive, it's very funny, you know. <laughs> it's, it's better than a cycling ordinary path. So this is once we had got rid of the trees, and you see it looks like an airfield. It's terrifying. I, I was absolutely catastrophic. And then we thought, how can we make this avenue in the park? It's a parkway, actually, with keeping, uh, collecting the rainwater inside and making uh, this central uh, place to, for the water and also for the tr trees to come. You see the, the, the railway uh, path is on the, on the side and it has its own topography. So the designing of this uh, V section is all there is as architecture, but if you do it by a W, it's more work, but it's much more interesting because not all the, the, the place is flooded with the first water. You understand? The first water is kept in its place and you can walk uh, elsewhere. So you see these are very, very simple things about sections and I know that uh, in Barcelona all this is very well known because when I was told you, uh, when I was a student, Barcelona was the utmost of uh, cross sections for public spaces and things like that. But even in, in with gardens and landscape, the, the details are, you know. Alors, one of the details is how to get the trees respected by the contractors. So one thing, one good thing is to make them show beautiful. If you keep them, uh, you know, like just like they are, uh, it, it's, it's not good. But if you prune them, then everybody knows this tree is important, I must not touch it. So I had a special talk with the guy in the crane here, and he made a marvelous job um, with this um, concrete wall. So you see, we, we designed the lanes to be able to keep some trees in the middle. When, when you first set the nivellement, I, I don't know how you say that, um, it, it shows up. It's like when you put up the table before the, the cooking, you know? It's the main part we do after I don't make the cooking myself. One, one essential thing is to understand that trees are like us. They, more, they need more to breathe than to eat. We breathe all the time, we eat sometimes. So they, they, they have roots that have to be in the air. There is air in the ground. It's very difficult to understand, but it's still true. If, if you stabilize the ground for the trucks not to move, for the cars to stay, that means you harden, you compact the ground, and this is fatal to trees. One way, very good way to keep together cars, we need them, and, and trees, is to make a mixture between rocks and ground. You make two volumes of rocks, of a special granulometry, and one volume of ground. You mix these together, the, the rocks block themselves, and in the void you get the ground and the air. 
and this will never uh, move anymore. You, you should do this by um, good weather, because otherwise you make concrete. And then you, you can have a hardened <laughs> surface. So these are my two boys trying to get uh, to be a locomotive, and they were very happy, so I tested the place. <laughs> We tried to keep some view cones, not to have uh, you know, everything blocked for the view. It's the, it's the end. I'm, I'm almost finished. <laughs> now, if you do an avenue from the start, it's easy to have all the trees in one place, all the cars in another. It's cheaper, and it's much better for trees. As long as you get the water of the surface of the road to come to the trees, it's perfect. So here you can see we have both um, um, uh, slow trees, like the, the oaks, and fast trees. They are all about the same size, but they, the, the poplars will go whoop, like that, and they will educate the oaks. And when the oaks grow big, the poplars will be in time for chopping off, you know? So th this way, you organize the relay. And most important is time. The all, for all about landscape is time. This is why, in f first place, I showed you that I discovered that tree grow. Now it's like that, you see, it's grown already a little bit but not as fast as the buildings. <laughs> it's, a, it's a business um, area, and it's quite funny to see people in jackets like that uh, strolling in the forest. <laughs> it's a special amb ambiance. Now, of course, this is back again. Uh, it's, it's before. We, you have to use some water. I'm sorry for the French, but it's good for your health. <laughs> Left uh, brain, I think. So the, the question is, how can you make people like to walk? You know, how, how can they uh, be... Um, flowers may be something. <laughs> and also, how to make the distance. We talked about the speed of trees, but you can talk about the speed of running people, of, of riding people, of driving people. You know, it's, it's what uh, Frederick Law Olmsted said about Central Park, New York. He said, walking, driving, riding. And that was the first place where the lanes would not interfere between the riding horses and... and... Thank you very much.